Welcome to Adopt and Class, and thank you for deciding to watch this video. You know, EKG is not that difficult. So this video is designed to calm you down, give you all the basics. And I'm going to use questions to help you. If you're struggling with EKG, I have 10 top loving rhythms that you have to know. But in the form of cases, cases that you will know will make it easy so that you can see how they're going to ask you questions. This is designed as a companion. So if you want to know how to answer EKG questions on the ankle list, then stick around and see what I have for you. Loving good questions, looking at um, top loving EKG so that you have to know. Before that, we have to know certain basics, very short information about um, EKG. This is a rhythm down. And then you have to know the EKG is basically designed to look at your functioning of your heart. And they have different names. Um, the, the rhythm you see below, the first segment, uh, you know, the heart as the atrium and the ventricular uh, portion. And each segment gives a signal, electrical signal, true conduction. We don't have to go into details. But straightforward, this is your P wave. And this is your Q your R and S wave, and this is your T. And you keep on continuing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, the atrial contraction. Um, so atrium is depolarized and they're repolarized. Then the ventricle will depolarize and then repolarize. What do you mean by depolarization and repolarization? Your cell usually stabilizes. It has a um, positive charge outside and negative charge inside. And when there's influx of electrolytes um, up and down the nerves, it causes repolar or the muscle. There's depolarization of that stabilized uh, muscle, and then it has to restabilize again movement of uh, electrolyte. So that's what we mean. What does the P wave indicate? The P wave, uh, if this is the atrium, this is the heart, the atrium is here. These are the two atriums, and the ventricles are down here. And the, the node, sinus node, a SA node is in the right atrium. And so basically, the depolarization of the atrium is what is a P wave. It's an atrium depolarized to fire the signals and pass it on to the ventricle through different nodal segments. We don't have to go into detail. Unfortunately, we don't see the repolarization of the atrium is buried in the PR interval. Okay. So we can see that, we can see that at all. Because of that, um, because of that, we um, we don't know what is the, uh, we don't have a signal for um, atrial uh, repolarization. So that's the first thing. The ventricle depolarization is the QRS signal, as you can see. And then after it fires, it has to repolarize before it can take another signal. There are some situations where the time of depolarization and repolarization are too close to each other. Um, and so the repolarization is the T wave of the ventricle. So that's what we have. This is the basics, right? Now, to read the EKG straightforward, all you need to do, the first thing you need to do is to look at the RR interval and calculate the heart rate. First, see if the rhythm is regular. So you look for, this is the R and R and R and see if the thick lines between them is regular. I see three, I see three thick lines, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Therefore, I know I'm dealing with the, what? Regular rhythm. If it's irregular, then you know it's AFib, right? Then you calculate the heart rate and see um, how fast it is. The, the, how you calculate the heart rate, if they tell you it's a six seconds, yeah, then you calculate the normal of RR interval within the six seconds. So normal of RR, so one, two, three, four, five, and you multiply. So normal of RR interval, the normal, of our intervals will give you 
the the idea of um, the heart rate basically. So if I say this is six seconds, I'll calculate one, two, three, four, five, and then I multiply by ten. That is the um, how to calculate the heart rate. If it's irregular, you have to take the whole RR interval using 60 seconds to calculate. So then you do the same thing. If they don't tell you it's six seconds, all you need to do, if it's not six seconds, or they don't um, they don't tell you it's a six seconds rhythm, look at the RR. What is the lines between them? One, two, three, um, and be probably four. So there's four thick lines between them. You just divide 300 over the four, and that will give you the heart rate. So those are the things. If I tell you this is six seconds, just calculate the number of hours and multiply by 10. Okay. If I say this is uh, it's irregular and they say it's six seconds, you have to go through and count 60 seconds total because if it's irregular. And if it's just, they don't tell you what it is, you just take our hour, just one hour, hour and see what is the numbers between them. They take one, two, three, four and divide it by eight. 300 and that will give you the rate okay then after you've deal with the regularity look for the p wave is there any p wave present then there's a qrs there's a p wave and there's qrs there's a p wave there's a qrs so the p and the qrs ratio is to be one to one that's all then you know this is good and they are identical then you calculate the pr interval so from here from here to here so this is the p okay and then this is the q going down and r so from this line from pr interval we need just five boxes okay it should not be greater than five boxes and the distance is like 1 0.01 to 0.02 so you counting one so from here i count one two three four I just have four boxes because one box is 0 0.0, 0 0.04. So I just need, I shouldn't go more than that, right? Um, this is 20. I should not get more than five, greater than five boxes between the P and the R. That means the PR interval is too long. Then you calculate the QRS. The QRS, you just need three boxes. This is only two boxes, so that is good. And you should not go past uh, 1.5, 1.4, because 0 0.04 times 3, it goes to like 0 0.01. So you just need three boxes between the QRS and see the morphology at all. That's all. That's all you need. Is the, is the uniform? This look uniform? Is the shape look fine? And everything look fine. So these are basics of the EKG. And then you can see what kind of rhythm is it. See, irregular AFib is... The heart rate faster is the QRS bigger is the PRRN interval is in uh, prolonged then you know what it is okay so just be systematic identify a P wave identify a QRS and make sure that you have a P a P a QRS after every before every P find your rate make sure it's regular calculate your heart rate and you know where, which whether it's a fast rhythm or it's a slow rhythm. Then you go by, if it's a slow rhythm, then it's a bradycardic rhythm. And you follow that pathway. If it's a fast rhythm, you go. And then you look at the patient. Is the patient stable or unstable? That's what you do. Okay, so that's the basics. Now let's look at a question. This is how we can study the rhythm. I think raw lecture is not enough. Just look at it. How to answer question, select or apply, right? Read it backward. What is the next priority action or action? So you take, tell yourself the next has to do something, an action, either one or two actions, and it has to be a priority. A 45-year-old man was uh, uh, admitted overnight for pre-operative evaluation pending um, abdominal aortic aneurysm repair. So they admit the patient. EKG was obtained and shown below, right? What do we do? This is what we're saying. I'm getting, so you have to analyze the questions. 
It's a selected apply. What would I do? Priority. Patient is getting surgery and we're doing in preoperative evaluation to make sure the heart is fine. And you have this, right? And so you go through the basics, right? You go through your RR, and just by looking the RR, you look normal. The distance one, two, three, one, two, three is all normal, right? So I know this is a sinus rhythm. I calculate my heart rate. This is fine. It's between like um you have three divided by um 300, I see one, two, three, maybe four, you can even add four. Yeah, it's less than 100, right? So I know this is a, a sinus rhythm and the heart rate is less than 100. I see a P wave of the FEQRS, P wave of the FEQRS. I look at a PR interval, it's less than five, QRS less than three, I have a sinus rhythm, a normal sinus with a heart rate fine. So you have a patient with the normal sinus rhythm at rate less than what 100. 60 to 100 is normal. Therefore, what do I do? Patient out there, this, his heart rate is fine, his EKG look normal. So this is a normal EKG. Therefore, we should not defibrillate the patient. Patient does no need CPR. He's not going to be happy about it. Patient does no need to be bolus. Do nothing and place the EKG in the chat. That's all, and the doctor can review it. So that's what you do as a nurse. So this is normal sinus rhythm, everybody. Most people have normal sinus rhythm unless there's anything wrong with the heart. And when you see this, you should not call the doctor. I mean, you just put it in the chat. If you see anything worrisome, yeah, calling the doctor for this is a wrong move. You ask you, is it normal? Yeah. So. This patient does not need anything. Put it in the chart and do nothing. Okay, sometimes it's difficult for us not to do anything, but this is what you do. Okay, so that's the first question. Normal sinus rhythm. We got to start from there. Now, we have another patient. What is this situation? The same thing, select or apply. You choose those that you're confident. If you know, you know it, choose it so that you don't lose the point for these generation questions. What is the next priority action or actions? Okay, what is the issue? A 50 year old client underwent uncomplicated laparoscopic appendectomy, bunch of ways. The rhythm was seen on cardiac monitor 24 hours post-surgery. So what would you do? You're breaking it down. What is being asked? What is your priority? What is the case? Patient had surgery, and everything went well. 24 hours later, they saw this rhythm, right? What would you do? And you go back, you said, my RR and see if it's sinus. I see if you measure from here to here, it's look fine. It's all normal. The distance is the same. So I know it's a sinus rhythm, right? Then I look for my P. I see, I calculate my rate first. I see one, two, only two big lines, this between the RR, from here to here, it's only two. And I can say that, what? Oh, maybe you can add one to it. So you don't count the first one, one, two, three. Uh, you can say, so there's 300. Um, I'll just use the two because um, this sometimes, it's an RR interval. So 200, 300 over two. So I have like, what, 150. 150, this is too high, right? This is too high, this look like, but I can see a sinus, I can see a P wave, I see a P wave, I see a P wave, I see a P wave, and every P wave for, is followed by QRS. But look at a um, QRS, there's no time for the T wave to finish. T wave finish the QRS, uh, the P wave pick, pick up. T wave finish PR pick up, and the distance, this is normal. The PR interval is so short, so short, like there's no time. So this is fast rhythm, um, but I can see P wave and my sign, I have a sinus rhythm. So this is a sinus tach. So sinus tachycardia. This is a very trappy question. It can trap you when every time for your boards, you see a sinus tachycardia, never treat it with medication. Unless, un, until you don't know what it is, medication is a wrong answer. 
There's a reason why people heart rate goes faster and it's sinus stack. QRS is fine, the P is fine, the interval looks fine, except the rate is fine. I don't see any um any worrisome, the shape look okay. Sinus stack is always a manifestation of something bad is happening. So don't treat it with medication now. Normal one thing you do is to find the source. What is causing the patient? the problem. Therefore, medication is never an answer choice. It may be this patient just had surgery. They may probably be in pain. So you assess for pain. Oh, they are dehydrated. Dehydration is also a cause of sinus tachycardia. Patient just had surgery. So check their in and out. How much urine they take, the pee, and how much fluid you've given them. It may be fever. Fever is a notoriously early sign of when somebody is going to get sepsis and they have fever, their heart rate goes up. So assess for fever. Number three, amiodarone is a wrong choice. You don't know the problem and you're trying to break it down. So this is also wrong. So which one are the answers? Three, two, five. So there's three answer choice. If you pick five, you get what? Zero. If you pick five, you may get one, yeah, because um, you subtract two answers from it. But you you have to pick those that you're confident, okay? So select those that you're confident. And then if you're confident about it, two, just choose it. Okay, just choose it. But this is how we see you go through the EKG. So we've seen sinus stack. We'll be able to identify it, and we'll be able to look at the causes, infection, um, there may be also bleeding, that is dehydration. So infection, dehydration, pain, um, something is causing it, or they have sepsis or bleeding. So these are all, you don't treat it with the medication until you figure out there is no other source, then you go back. So priority action does not mean treat it right away. You got to look for the problem. Okay, so that's the first, second rhythm you should know and the causes in the treatment. Number three, same thing, right? The next anticipated plan of care include, so select or apply, right? What is the problem? A 35-year-old client presented to the emergency room after threatening suicide. Client recently broke up with the spouse, right? And heart rate was 120, and subsequent EKG shown below. The next anticipated plan of care is this. So what is the question? What, what would I do? What is the problem? Somebody broke up with a boyfriend, girlfriend, came in tachycardic to 120, and you obtain this EKG, and you have this. What do you think? The same thing. Look for RR, and I can tell that this is uniform. Therefore, I know I have sinus. Then I calculate my heart rate. What is the heart rate? It's barely one, uh, two. So I know um, they don't tell him me if this is six seconds, they're not telling me, I know it's not irregular. So since I, they don't tell me it's six seconds, I'm not calculating, counting all the out, one, two, three, four, five, multiply by 10, no. I'm just doing the big line between each hour. And it's barely, it's almost one and a half. So 300 over one and a half is greater than 150, right? So, um, I know this heart rate is greater than 150. Like if you look at this one, it's one. I mean, so it's like, it's greater than 150. So this is, and then I look at the P wave. You can even descend it. It's like buried with the uh, T wave. It's too fast. The T wave, which is the uh, repolarization of the ventricle is now being buried with the, um, what do you call it? Atrial and depolarization. When you see that, that means there's no time for the ventricle and the atrium. They, they don't have time for each other. There's no relaxation. So this is a fast rhythm. The uh, QRS is, is no greater than three boxes, so that's good. The P wave, you can't even figure it out. Uh, but this is a fast rhythm, and then it's SVT. This is supraventricular tachycardia. It's too fast. This is SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, faster rhythm than sinus um, tachycardia, right? So what do you do? 
there's so many causes that will happen. It's supraventricular tachycardia. That means supra, the definition, above the ventricle, ventricle, ventricular tachycardia. So supraventricular tachycardia means the, 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 the fast rhythm is coming from the atrium itself. It's above the ventricle, supraventricular, right? Therefore, what do I do? I need to slow this patient down. But what the next anticipated plan of care, the management of SVT, the first thing you need to do is to see if the patient is very, very symptomatic or not symptomatic. If they have no symptoms, that means they have no dizziness, shortness of breath, their blood pressure is not going down. What you do is try to calm them down and then give them medication to do that. So if there is no symptoms, or they are not extremists. That means, uh, extremists means your blood pressure is low, okay, you dizzy, you have symptoms, shortness of breath, you know, you confuse. All those patients need immediate therapy rather than doing medication and other maneuver. So this patient, they never told me the patient have any problem, right? They, they, they never told me. All they told me is the heart rate, and she's mad at the girlfriend or boyfriend, right? What you do is vagal maneuver. Initial vagal maneuver is very good because they don't have symptoms. If vagal maneuver doesn't help, I did not see after initial initial maneuver fails. If that doesn't help, vagal maneuver, like let them bear down and do single carotid and massage, pour ice in their face. If that doesn't help, yeah, you give them adenosine, right? Like I said, and before you start all these things, you check for symptoms and make sure your patient does not have symptoms. Otherwise, you have to quit work faster. Synchronize cardioversion if symptoms is present. Yes, that's what you do. And when you're doing synchronized cardioversion, there's certain things you have to do. You got to put the sync mode on. So sync mode on because you're using the same defibrillation. Every uh, crash card has a defibrillator and defibrillator can be pushed, turned into a, uh, can be used for cardioversion. But to use it for cardioversion, you need to put the sync mode on. And therefore put the sync mode on. The patient needs sedation. You need to give them some sedation, right? You need to obtain consent and tell them that what you're going to do. And then you 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 shock them. As soon as then you shock them, usually it's very low uh, uh, voltage to shock them. But synchronized cardioversion if the patient is symptomatic. Sync mode off for cardioversion. The sync mode should be on. So the answer choice is one, two, three, four. Okay. So this is a companion, like I said, just to try to teach you how to answer questions on an EKG using all this information, okay? So that's our rhythm, number three. And you have to know, supraventricular tachycardia. Number four, what do we have? Same thing, right? The anticipated plan of care will be what? That, they do not say select or apply, that means one single answer. And what is the question? A 50-year-old client on the telemetry ward was resting buzzwords comfortably, okay, and having dinner at the following rhythm with heart rate of 140. What is my plan? I have a patient who is just sitting down, eating comfortable, enjoying his food, and, at, and the, the rhythm shows heart rate of what? One for a uh, heart rate of 40, but it looks fine. So his heart rate is what 40, and then it looks fine. What would you do? And this is the EKG. You check what is the rhythm. Is it sinus? Just by looking at it, you have to eyeball it. I look at it from the length from year to year, is the same. So I have a sinus. And what is my heart rate? And they don't tell me it's a six seconds, so I have to use RR. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So 300 over seven. Um, this is very, very low. 
right? It's, it's very, very low ad rate based on the numbers that they've given me. And it's closer to the 40 that they got. It's very close to it. So uh, what do you think? What, what would a 300 divided by seven? It's like 42, right? So at three, we are 42, which is almost close to that 42 or 43, right? So patient is what? It's a slow heart rate. And then you look at a P, the P interval, I can count one, two, three, four. There's four boxes. And a QRS, there's two boxes. So I'm good. This is not greater than five. And this is not greater than three. So I'm good. So, and there's P, QRS. There's P, QRS. And there's P, QRS. Look at this. This is the what I was telling you about the SVT. After the ventricular repolarization, look at the distance. It took a while for the atrium to fire and the ventricle fire again. And then it took, a, and then the ventricle relaxes. It took another long time for the atrium to do contraction. This is it. There's always a pause between the ventricular repolarization to the atrial depolarization. So this took a long time. That's why the heart rate is very low. So I have a bradycardic patient who has no symptoms. He's doing fine. It's okay. Right? And he's eating dinner. What do you want to do? If you do vigo maneuver, vigo maneuver means you're causing the parasympathetic nervous system to take over. This will decrease the heart rate more. And therefore, this is a wrong move. If you give them a better blocker, you're going to decrease their heart rate more. This is going to be a problem. I will check whether they have symptoms because atropine is used for symptomatic bradycardia. Therefore, I'll check my priority function is to check whether they have symptoms. They're eating dinner. The heart rate is 40. I know it's worrisome. Do you going to do something to a patient who is sitting there resting comf comfortably and eating dinner, enjoying themselves? It may be an athlete. And therefore, there's nothing for you to do. So don't give them atropine. I know the heart rate is very low, but don't give them atropine. Atropine will increase the heart rate. Somebody who's eating dinner and eat, sitting comfortably, that means they meet the highball test. In, in medicine, we call highball test. That means when you walk into the room, their leg is crossed, they're reading their Bible or a book, and their heart rate is uh, 40. They have no, they look fine. The grapple sheet is okay. Everything is fine. Nothing for you to do. So for this patient, we just do, don't do anything. So bradycardic, if you're symptomatic, I give you atropine. If atropine does not work, we, and it depends on also how symptomatic you are. Okay. If you have like uh, systolic blood pressure, really, really low, sometimes the best answer choice when they are symptomatic is transcutaneous pacemaker. Right? If they are not really, they tell you they're sweaty a little bit, yeah, give them atropine and that will bring it up. And if that doesn't work, you do transcutaneous pacemaker. So transcutaneous uh, pacemaker, basically, that is the best choice um, uh, for patients who are really, really symptomatic. Okay, so for this patient, slow heart rate, you see different rhythm, it's very slow. We know P and QRS are okay. It's just a long time for uh, um, after the repolarization of the ventricle before the atrial um, depolarize. Okay, rhythm number four. Rhythm number five. What do we have? The next anticipated plan of action will be what? Okay, forty-five year old. Client at surgery, sigma resection after a uh, post op day one. That means after surgery, the following day, found to have the rhythm below. We had surgery, and this is what we find. The patient report what? He's telling you, I'm dizzy, my blood pressure, systolic blood pressure is 80. What would you do? Then you look at it and you said, hmm, I got to do my RR interval. 
from here to here, if I look from here to here, it's not the same distance. This is not the same. Even this is not the same. So the rhythm is not regular. This is irregular rhythm. There's only one you should worry about, atrial fibrillation. That means the atrium is fibrillating. And if the atrium is fibrillating, I should not be seeing any P waves at all. You see, And you can see, I don't see a P wave here. I see the QRS, then I see T wave, that's the ventricle and repolarization. Then I don't see anything, whether the atrium is contraction, but it's, it's there, it's buried. We don't see it, it's so fast that it's quivering. It's like doing like that, okay? There's, that's what we call atrial uh, fibrillation. It's different from ventricular uh, fibrillation. So atrial is fibrillating, it's like shaking, it's like it's acting out. The blood is there, it's just rot rotating, not doing anything, right? It's a fast rhythm, right? And you have to calculate, and you can see from here, there's only one distance, so probably it's greater than, I can assume the heart rate is greater than 150, but you have to get full 60 seconds, and then you can calculate, right? But look at it, this is what we have. Irregular rhythm, fast one, and I have symptoms. My blood pressure is low. So this is the same thing. We call them tachy arrhythmia. Right? It's the same thing like the SVT, but it's different. The management, though, is the same. Every tachyarrhythmia, SVT, AFib, atrial fibrillation, or atrial flutter, no matter what, any tachyarrhythmia, if they have symptoms, your normal one is to do what? Synchronize cardioversion. That's your best choice, okay? And so for this patient, that's what we're going to do. Vigo maneuver is not going to help with this patient with the blood pressure of 80 and dizziness. He has symptoms. It's a tachyarrhythmia. You have to do something. You have no time. So I'm not going to do this. Amiodarone may help, but patient blood pressure is 80 and dizziness. I need to do something faster, okay? I need to do something faster, so I'm not going to choose medication. CPR, no. This is not a patient who, they will be sitting there looking at you, say, why are you pushing on my chest? They don't need a CPR. They need immediate, synchronized cardioversion, okay? Because the systolic blood pressure is 80 and it is you, and we got to get them back as soon as possible. So put a sync mode on and do immediate synchronized cardioversion. If you defibrillate them, you kill them. Okay, so the answer is normal four, synchronized cardioversion. Okay, and so I said, if the patient has no dizziness and his systolic blood pressure is now what, 110. So I have no dizziness. And my systolic blood pressure is 110. What is your plan? So the same thing, atrial fibrillation and the patient has no symptoms. You look fine. Yeah, for this patient, medication is good. So you can give them either a beta blocker, you can give them a calcium channel blocker, or you can give them amiodarone. Amiodarone is the drug of choice. So this patient is going to get amiodarone. Vigo maneuver is not going to work. It work with SVT, okay? The patient will not need a CPR, will not need defibrillation. They may need synchronized cardioversion, but later, if the amiodarone does not work, you have to give them amiodarone times two. But if you give me the amiodarone, the first dose is 150, and the second dose is 300. And if none of them work, then you have to synchronize cardioversion with the sync mode on. Normal four with them, normal. Five with them, you have to know atrial fibrillation. Another content here, if the patient has AFib, you see, I keep on saying cardioversion, amiodarone. That means AFib, normal one treatment, is rate control. Control their rate. Don't worry about anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is normal two. Later on, when they, you've ruled out everything, you get an echocardiogram 
and everything before you give them what? Anti-coagulation. So when they give you a question, they say somebody is in AFib, what is your priority? It's rate control, not anticoagulation. So control their rate first before anticoagulation. Okay, number six, that you have to know for your test. Number six, which of the following is accurate for the rhythm shown below? So which one you think is accurate? Select or apply. We got to come back. Say, mm, what do we have? Uh, I have to look at my uh, uh, the same rhythm. You got to develop the keep on doing that. Is the distance from here to here the same? Yeah, one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I have what? Regular rhythm. Therefore, I know it's not a fit. And I look, I calculate my rate, one, two, three. Um, so it's close to 100, you know, it, it's not perfect. Or oh, it can be four, uh, but yeah, hey, yeah. um, we're going to use the 100. So it's a little bit high, 100 is not that bad uh, based on this rhythm, but most of the time, um, they're faster than this. But look at it, I see a bunch of P wave. I don't even know whether this is T wave, but I see another P wave, P wave, P wave. T, Q, R, S, P, a bunch of, you see, after the T wave, you see this, what is this? What is this? What is this? So you keep on seeing this, 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 this. After the T wave, what does it look? It look like so. If I draw a this thing here, it look like so with the teeth. This is what we call saw toothed, saw toothed wave. And this is atrial flutter. It's a flutter wave, okay? It's a flutter wave. Um, this one F, it's a flutter wave. And therefore, this is almost similar to the FF, but it has a sinus rhythm. So the rhythm is sinus, but the atrial, in a, you know, atrial fibrillation, you don't see the, a, the a P wave. But this one, you see the P wave, but you see a bunch of P waves. I see a bunch of P wave. That is a flutter wave. Your treatment is the same. You got to rate control them before anticoagulation. And if they have symptoms, you have to synchronize cardioverge them. If they have no symptoms, then you just uh, give them medication to bring them back. So which of these is accurate for the rhythm? Based on this, I know this is a flatter wave. Commonly described as what saw toothed, yes. Amiodarone, if no symptoms, yeah. If they don't have symptoms, I give them amiodarone, calcium channel block, or a beta blocker. Synchronized cardioversion, if they have symptoms, yes. Immediate defibrillation, no, you should not do that. P wave was present. Yes, there's a P wave, and there's a bunch of them you don't know. So I can see P wave. Rhythm is regular. I know it's a regular rhythm. I'm just trying to give you the features so that you can see the difference between a flutter wave and a fib. I see a regular uh, rhythm. I see a, a bunch of P waves um, and a treatment is synchronized cardioversion or an, um, anti-rhythmic medication, a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, amiodarone. Um, but that is the way the question would be. And this is the rhythm you should be familiar with, a so toothed. And it's all heart problem. It's all from the atrium. This is the atrial issue. Um, recognize them, know how to treat them, and the management. This is um, my companion for you. I hope you understand. Okay, so that's the sixth rhythm. Seven. Seven, no my seven. So I select or apply. I like select or apply, as you can see. And I like to do this because it gives you thinking and be able to analyze the question. What is the next anticipated action? So what would the next do? As always, read it from the back so that you know what the question is, so that you can think about it. Sata, what is the next anticipated action? That means it would, the next is supposed to do something. Then you read the rest of the question. A client with no pause, he has no pause, no breathing with the rhythm below. I 
no pause, negative pause, negative greeting, and I have this. What do you see? The same thing. We got to calculate RR interval. Do you see any RR? No. Can you calculate this rate? No. Can't calculate that. Do you see any P wave? No. You see any QRS? No. That means we just have a flat line. I have a flat line. A patient has no pause, no breathing, which is expected because they, they are flat line. The heart is no pumping, so no blood going to the brain, and the lung is not working, right? So this is what we call a systole. A systole. There is no systolic. Remember, this is where it came from. Systolic blood pressure contraction of the ventricle. Systole. The diastolic is receiving of the blood from the system, and then the heart pump during systole. From diastole, it receives blood. So we can tell that this heart is not pumping. That's why it's called a systole. There's no contraction anywhere. And I'm no, I don't have pause. And I'm not greedy. What would you want to do? What do you want to do? Yes, this patient needs his heart to be pumped right away. Keyword, this is not a shockable reading. You can't shock this patient. You kill them. You have to keep the heart pumping so we get a CPR as much as possible. So keep me my heart pumping by giving me compression and giving me something to breathe. So immediate defibrillation is a wrong answer. Never choose asystole. If you put fire in them, you kill them. High quality CPR, excellent. And then what are you doing? 100 to 120 compression per minute. Okay. One milligram of epinephrine Q to five minutes. Yes, that. So you do CPR for two minutes. You check the rhythm and you give them epi, one milligram epi. And you do another CPR, two minutes. You check the rhythm. If they're still in asystole, another epi. If after two rounds, they're still in the same, you do CPR and you change your medication. You may use amiodarone. Amiodarone as the next. So this is the ACL as you should know it by now, right? So one milligram of epinephrine every three to five minutes. Synchronized cardioversion. Once again, this patient is not getting any shock. He's not being synchronized. His heart is not pumping. So we are not giving them any fire. So this is wrong. Look for H and T's. Yes. Why are you doing CPR and you're giving them the epinephrine? There's something we call H and T's. H and T's. Okay, these are the causes of asystole. They are normal one causes of asystole and then causes of um, um, PEA. So H, like um, hypokalemia, hypovolemia, um, hypotension, hypothermia, all the IPOs, anything that has a uh, IPO. And the T is anything that can cause the heart from stopping or your breathing. So tension, hemothorax, right? Temperate, right? Uh, toxic medication, uh, thrombosis. Thrombosis. 
So these are things you should be looking for. Is the patient hypovolemic? Is the patient have hypokalemia? Is the patient has hypertension? Is that they cold? Or do they have tension in the thoracic? Or do they have tamponade? Or any toxic, any medication, any uh, PE? So that's PE form under thrombosis. That's what is causing. So you look for H and T. Therefore, this is our answer. This is our answer. This is our answer. And this is a systole, a systole. And never, never, never shock this. Okay. So no defibrillation and no cardioversion. Okay. Number seven. Number eight. This is my favorite. So what is the next anticipated action? Select or that apply. A client with no pulse, he has no pulse. He's not also breathing with the rhythm below. How can you not have pulse and no breathing? But you have this electrical activity. You have to know that. This is what we call P-E-A. It's pulseless. Pulseless electrical activity. Guess what? The heart is trying to show you that I'm pumping, but there's no blood flow. That's why the patient has no pulse and they're not breathing. So this is like a fake EKG. You have a, a signal, but the heart is flat. It's not doing anything. This is the same. When you see PA is treated as the same as a systole. Even though you see this, the heart is not pumping a single blood. If the heart is not pumping a single blood, what will you do? Never shock a heart that is not pumping. What you need to do is CPR for two minutes, like you do with the a systole. Then check the rhythm, give them epi, and then you go with your CPR. You keep on going, for two rounds, nothing, you give them amiodarone, right? And you start looking for H and T's until the rhythm changes, until they have a pause, until they have a breathing pause is number one, or return of circulation. Yeah, you keep on doing that and look for your H and T's. Once again, immediate defibrillation. This is not a shockable rhythm. You can't shock it. If you shock a PEA or a systole, you kill them. So never shock a PEA, pulseless electrical activity, or a systole. So defibrillation is bad. High quality CPR, excellent. One milligram of epi, the same things. Synchronized cardioversion, you can't shock them. Look for HNTs, the same thing. So you treat it like a asystole, once again. Electrical signal with no pulse is called pulseless electrical activity and never shock those patients. Okay, those are PEA. Okay, so that's normal eight. Rhythm, you should know for your test. Okay, this is a high yield stuff I'm doing, taking my time explaining because of request, I've got multiple requests of EKG. And I hope this sort of, um, um, you guys can get something out of it. Norma nine. What is the next immediate action? What would she do? A client with no pulse, patient has no pulse, and they're reading below. Look at it. You go through your mentor, don't, don't jump the gun. You ask yourself, do I see RR interval? Yeah, there is the RR here. I see. See RR. And you look uniform, therefore, it's not AFib, it's sinus. Yes, a sinus feature about it, right? But what is, how can, can I calculate my heart rate? I just see one line. So over 300, it's too high, it's greater than 150, right? I don't even see a P wave. So I'm not even going to attend. I see a QRS, but it's the shape is weird. It's not, it's like that. But it's uniform though. 
but the distance, look at it, from here to here is more than what? We're supposed to get what? Three. It's greater than three boxes. So our QRS is greater than three boxes. In your description, when you see what we call wide QRS complex, this is what they're referring to. So we have a ventricular problem. I don't even see the atrium. So the a ventricle is taking over the atrium. He said, I don't need any signal from you. So we have a ventricular problem that is fast. So tachycardia, ventricular tachycardia. And it's uniform. So why complex, QRS complex, ventricular tachycardia. That is uniform. This is what we call VTAC, ventricular tachycardia. What is your treatment for this problem? Normal one is check if they have pause. If they have pause, it changes the whole thing. So I'm going to clean this. So I have a VTAC. I have two things. See if there is a pause or there is no pause. If there is a pause, yeah, it become tachy arrhythmia. And I told you how to take care of tachy arrhythmia. If you check if they have symptoms, that means no symptoms plus symptoms. If they do, you do synchronize cardioversion. If they have no symptoms, you give them medication first before you go to here. If they have no pause, it turn into fib, ventricular fibrillation. That is what we have to defibrillate the heart. And this is the management, it's complete management of VTAC. So what would the nurse do? My normal one, I did not say, um, yeah, it, it, what is the net immediate action? You know, what would you do? Yeah, immediate defibrillation is what? What do you think? Immediate defibrillation? Yeah, we should not defibrillate this patient. Okay, we should not defibrillate this patient. Why you don't want to defibrillate them? Why you don't want to do that? Because we got to make sure that the patient either has pause or not. So what is the next immediate action? Yeah, this is wrong because if the patient has pause, we've killed them. So we got to check for pause. We may need this if they have no pause, but for now we got to check pause. I did not put SATA here, so that's the thing. Synchronized cardioversion. If they have a pause, yeah, we may go through that route, but for now, not. Look for H and T's, like I said. The first thing you have to do is to check pause first. And then if they have pause, we go this pathway, tachyarrhythmic like pathway. If they have no pause, we go defibrillation pathway. So that is the normal one. What if the patient has pause? Yes, if the second one. If they have pause, yeah, you go tachyarrhythmia, you give them medication, beta blocker, amiodarone, calcium channel blocker, right? But before you do that, see if they have symptoms. If they have symptoms, you do cardioversion. If they have no symptoms, then you give them those medications. So there's certain steps you have to do. And this is the mental capacity the mental thinking we go through. And this is why people are afraid of EKG because it's a passing level question and the answer choice is critical thinking. You got to go through. Even though that say, what if he has a pause? You've not finished thinking. If he has a pause, okay. Then you ask yourself again, is the patient symptomatic? Is he dizzy? Is blood pressure is in the forties? That I don't have time to give them medications to bring their heart, shock them right away. Yeah, if they have symptoms, 
you do immediate and synchronized cardioversion. But if they don't have symptoms, you have time, you prepare your medication, you give it to them. Okay? So that is the normal nine rhythm, ventricular tachycardia. With all the courses and the management strategy. You can watch this multiple times. And that's what it's designed. So you can go to, and this is normal 10. Right? What is the next immediate action? What would the next do? What will the next do? Immediate action. It's not a select or apply, right? So what would you do? A client with no pause. Client has no pause. Client has no pause. And the rhythm below. You go to your mentor. What is your RR? A CR. I see another, this is down, up, going here, then this down. So I see my RR is not uniform, unlike the other one, right? So irregular kind of, but I don't see what, HO at all. So I don't see a P wave. The QRS is not uniform. Therefore, it cannot be VTAC. You see, and it's wide. Look at it. It's more than three boxes. Okay, so QRS, I have wild QRS. That is not uniform. So it's chaotic. The word chaotic is the key. Chaotic wave. And this is what we call ventricular fibrillation. I don't see a P wave at all. They re they, 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 the heart rate is very fast, and you see the ventricle basically doing its own thing. The is not uniform; it's like all over the place. It's wide, wide. So these are some sometimes the least thing to describe it without not giving you EKG. So you look at them: wide QRS complex that is not uniform. It's a VFib. See, with really the very fast. So what is VFib? Well, the heart is quavering. This one is dangerous. It's one of the little rhythm. Bring them back. Number one, and I will say something. When they have ventricular fibrillation, I know you need to shock them. Like do a CPR first, whilst you go and get the AED. And then when you bring the AED, you do fibrillation. If there's a CPR in the answer choice, I will pick that one. If there's no CPR, and I will defibrillate. So for this one, once again, if you have VFib, you don't want to shock them right away because then you destroy the heart. The heart that is not pumping will, will, will be destroyed. So keep them, you know you have to defibrillate them, but start CPR for two minutes, then go get an AED and then or the code card and then lay down shock them after two minutes. So yeah, immediate defibrillation is good. Amiodarone will be the next one after you give them epi in two minutes later on. So this is wrong. One milligram of epinephrine, yeah, they will need it, but not right now. I did not put selector. If I put selector to apply, yeah, this may be. What is the next immediate, I said, immediate action? Yeah, so one as a choice. Synchronized cardioversion, no. This is need to be defibrillated. I will look for H and T's but immediate action, I need to defibrillate. So that's number one. Okay. That's the management of that. So that's 10. Now, same thing, number 10. So yes, that's number 11. So what do we have? Select or apply. Which of the following need immediate intervention? A client in the ICU with the rhythm below. Go through your mental process, break it down. So select or apply. And I need to intervene right away, immediate intervention, right? I put select or apply, that means multiple answers. And then we have a patient in the ICU with this. What do you think? Go through. RR interval, right? 
We go from here, from here. I see RR, but it's all over the place, right? It looks like uniform, but it's changing in shape. Change in shape, keywords. You can calculate RR. Uh, the heart rate is also greater than 150. You can see from here, it's just one or two, right? I can't even see P wave, so I know it's not an atrial problem. There's no P wave, so it cannot be atrial. So answer choice, I know it cannot be atrial problem. I see QRS, but this QRS is different, right? You start from here, it goes down, and it meandering. Okay, it start going down, it becomes smaller, smaller, then it becomes bigger, then it go down. So meandering. We have a meandering shape of the whole wave. Or you can say change shifting, a shifting change. These are all buzzwords, shifting QRS complex. You know, it's a little bit, not that too wide, but slightly wide. You know, but it's changing shape, meandering like a snake. If you trace it, you see like it look like a snake. This is what we call Tosad de Pontes. So we have Tosad de Pontes. What is the cause of this? It's because of QT is prolonged. Therefore, anything that causes QT prolongation will lead to so sad. So what, which of these the next you immediately intervene? You got to find causes of QT prolongation and then we have QRS um, to sad upon this. Magnesium is number one causes prolonged Q, QT prolongation. Therefore, this is good. Magnesium of one is too low. But Dan Citron, which is an anti emetic, it also causes QT prolongation. Therefore, yeah. Patient already have this rhythm and they on this medication, yeah, I got to stop it. Maybe that's what is causing this problem. Erythromycin, all the myces can cause QT prolongation. So we got to stop it. Zaprasidone is used for anti, it's an antipsychotic, also causes QT prolongation. And therefore, you make this longer and longer and longer. I need to stop it. Amiodaron also causes QT prolongation. Patients on amiodaron for AFib. Is it because they're taking too much amiodaron that is causing this problem? Yeah, I got to stop it first and figure out what is the problem. So all these are causes of QT prolongation. And so when you see that, you should intervene as soon as possible. Otherwise, this is a warning sign. To say the point is, it's a little rhythm, but it's giving you a warning. Unlike VFEB or VTAG or asystole or PE, PEA, this is a warning sign saying my magnesium is low I'm having QT prolongation. Please help me slow, help me stop the offending agent. So if I put stop offending a agent here, you should choose that as a choice. So the number one answer choice is stop the offending agent and give them magnesium. So try to get your magnesium to, uh, to um, and that will help with that. So give them magnesium to resolve this problem or stop the offending, stop the odansitron, stop the erythromycin, stop the zaprasidone, stop the amiodarone, and give them magnesium. Uh, and check the electrolytes. I would also put check the electrolytes and make sure the magnesium is not that too low. And this is the management of Tosad de Pontes. It's a warning sign. If you don't do anything, you progress to cardiac arrest. Okay, normal loving. With them. Okay. Now, this is a normal 10 rhythm, but I intentionally labeled normal 11 because um, 
and I just want to emphasize a point. A client in the ICU with the rhythm below, so they have this rhythm. We've seen this before, right? This is VFib. Clients receive what? Two runs of CPR. So this should say CPR. So they are CPR already with returns of spontaneous circulation. So you have ROS. That's what we got. Return of spontaneous circulation. ROS. That means we did two runs CPR. We give them epi. We sh shock them. And then their heart is back. The return of ROS means we have a rhythm. We can have C, a sinus rhythm. And they may have blood pressure. So blood pressure probably like 80, 90. And they may have a pulse. Right? Client is still non-responsive. So they have VFib. We shock them. We push on your chest. And now they have a pulse. They have a blood pressure. What would you do? Return of spontaneous circulation. This, they like asking critical care. You have to know that as a nurse. Anybody who has a return of spontaneous circulation, there's certain things you have to do. Make sure the airway is intact. Make sure they're getting some fluid. Make sure the medication you give them that bring them their heart back, you keep them as a drip. If you give them epi, epinephrine, and you bring their heart rate back and they have rhythm, you should put it in the drip. If you use amiodarone, do the same thing. Whatever medication you use, okay, to bring them back, usually we keep it as a drip. But most of the time, it's epi that help with that. So give them epi drip, right? And then number one is to slow down their brain activity, slow down their metabolic activity. And that is the therapeutic hypothermia. Drop their temperature to close 89. You want to keep the temperature 89, between 97 and 89, really, really low. Drop it down. That will improve their mortality. You don't want them to have complications from the hypoxic brain. So drop their heart rate as a, their temperature as low. Hypothermia usually is bad. But for this patient, hypothermia is their friend. So drop their temperature really low up to like 89 to 97. Okay, they need a Foley catheter to monitor your urine output and they need the engine tube. They need other things, but whatever they need, okay? So airway, advanced airway means you have an endotracheal tube, ET tube in place. Epinephrine drip to maintain your blood pressure. Therapeutic hypothermia, which is normal one, to keep their metabolic rate low. So this will decrease their metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate, and allow the brain to function. Fully to monitor the urine output, NG tube, uh, to, because they intubate it. And when they intubate it, NG tube. But there's so many things you can do, but these are the key things every patient should have who have a return of spontaneous circulation. So these are all the rhythms, management, EKG questions, classic EKG questions. I want you to be familiar with. Uh, this will require you watching this video multiple times and be comfortable. And no matter the way they will ask you, interpret the EKG, see the scenario, and answer them based on your content. I hope I satisfy you, answers most of your questions you may have. If you've not subscribed, subscribe to this channel for content like that. And keep charging. All the best of luck. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye.